Well, welcome to a sort of a special episode of the Canadian Pastors Forum, where we wanted to talk about an important issue that's happening in the world right now, which is the Israel-Hamas conflict. And while all of us here are not experts on the deep international political uh, things that are happening in this world, we realize that a ton of people are asking questions about this. A ton of Christians are asking questions about this. Sometimes people have eschatological beliefs that lead them to really want to know what is happening in the Middle East. And Paul Carter, I know you wrote a article recently on this. It was a very kind of simple one, but it had a lot of pastoral guidance and counsel. So maybe I could just start by asking you, like, why did you write it? And where did it, what did it come out of? Was it out of real conversations? Yeah, well, I would say for me, most of my writing is uh, caused by one of two things. Either I've stumbled across a Bible passage that I'd like to think more about, and I often will sort of understand things by writing. And so I'll do the study and do the writing. So maybe 80% of my articles are like that. And then the remaining 20% are usually, if I get asked a question twice by, um, by a younger pastor, you know, in a two week period, then I, I figure, okay, this is worth an article. And I, yeah, I had a couple questions on what do you say about the, the Israel Hamas situation? What's the right way to think about that? I'm starting to field questions. What should I say to people? I think uh, for a lot of pastors in our circle, and by our circle, I, I just mean kind of the conservative, evangelical, small R, reformed pocket of the world. Um, we have a lot of people who have come to our churches because they like biblical preaching, but they may have come out of various theological backgrounds. And so when a crisis hits like this, it puts pressure and all of a sudden everybody's eschatology comes out, everybody's theological system comes out, and the young pastor is wondering what in the world just happened? And, and you're seeing congregants posting things on, on Facebook where Jesus and Israel are used interchangeably and where Israel even seems to replace Jesus in, in terms of the redemptive focus of God's work in the world. And all of a sudden you realize something is going on in my church and I don't, I don't know how to address it. Um, I, I had people the, the Sunday that this was just happening. Like if you recall, I think, I think the attacks uh, from Hamas on Shabbat. Were the, yeah, they were on Saturday night, right? And so a lot of us, you know, if, if you're a pastor and you're you're showing up at church at 7 a.m. in the morning on a Sunday, you haven't watched the news. You didn't know. And so on Sunday afternoon, I got an email from a congregant going, you know, why didn't we, you know, pray for Israel, talk about Israel? I had people asking if we should scrap all of our prayer meetings for the week and just like hold vigils for Israel. And I was like, okay. Um, and, and other pastors are facing those same questions. So that's, that's why I wrote, I, I tried to give a little, what I hope was common sense counsel. Hmm. Are you, Rob, are you having similar situations in your congregations where people are coming up to you and asking or sending you an email on the morning of October 8th? Like, what are we, how are we responding to this? Yes, we, we definitely are. Uh, and, and I would say similar logic to some of the COVID struggles we had and similar angst hmm. and passion. Uh, even I would say carefully, because I know this is being published, similar cognitive dissonance. So yes, I, I do think it's helpful to address and helpful for us to remember who God is and what God's doing and his commands that are clear and some of the stuff that perhaps is more debatable. And then how do we respond to not, not only this crisis, but the number of things that are going on around us in the world that is chaotic. So maybe let me yeah, I agree. You go Sorry, ahead. I, I'd agree, pick up with where Rob left off because I think um, what we've seen in our congregation is similar. It's people who are, in large part, born again Christians. They're born of the Spirit. They're regenerate, but they remain confused in mind, and so they bring secular framework to bear on these questions. You know, whatever the question of the day happens to be. Um, and what we found with this issue was people were defaulting to equal and opposite problems or errors. Right on the one hand, they were either getting whole hog behind the current geopolitical Israel, because that's the chosen people of God, you know, which is not a biblical appropriation of that category. Or on the other hand, they were getting behind Hamas and the Palestinians because they are the oppressed people. Yeah. And that secular narrative says, well, the moment you're oppressed, there's inherent virtue in that. And so what we tried to do, and I did this this past Sunday in my sermon, thankfully, I'm preaching through Acts, so it was easy. You know, you have the unbelieving Jews who dragged Paul out on the street and stoned him. Um, and I was able to talk about this, right? How do we deal with passages like this that can lead to anti-Semitism? And then how does this speak to this current issue? Um, and just setting before people biblical categories to rightly think about this present crisis. 
That, that was helpful. And that kind of lead in, that was basically the question I wanted to ask was, so how are you pastorally answering when someone comes up to you and says, pastor, Israel and Hamas are at war. How do we respond? Which I know is a weird reality because on Twitter or whatever it is, October 7th, people see these videos, violent and evil videos. And they ask you on October 8th or 9th, like, how do, how do we respond? What, what is your answer? Artie, you gave some great biblical categories. I think that was helpful. Can, can Rob uh, and Paul, can you guys expand on that a little bit? What do you, how do you practically respond to these sorts of questions as a pastor? Well, I, Artie, I was interested to hear that you're in Acts and uh, dealing with, you know, Paul's trial, because that's actually exactly where we were as well. Hmm. And it was interesting. So, you know, I'm, I'm preaching on, you know, Paul making his defense uh, before the the crowd in Jerusalem. Paul arrested in Jerusalem was the topic I was preaching on last Sunday, and uh, and I actually I just stopped in the middle of my sermon and said, you know, kind of off the cuff, like it wasn't in in the manuscript or the notes. I, I just said, now listen, I understand that probably as you're all listening to this, you got a split screen in your brain and you're trying to figure out is he talking about like the Israel on the news, or or is he talking about Israel in the New Testament? And I said, I want to be very clear, like I, I'm talking about where the I'm going back to the fork in the river here, because that's what Luke is showing us. Luke is showing us why Judaism and Christianity split, why why it is that Christianity was you know largely rejected by the people from which it sprang. So that's what I'm talking about. But there is a conversation about, so what does that mean for Israel today? What does that mean for Israel on the news? And, and I and I think just as you say, a lot of people have not thought that through. And and but the, but if you help them, if you say, so listen, like you understand that. If an Israeli, if a person who is Israeli by ethnicity, if they reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, if they reject that Jesus is the Messiah, you understand that they're no longer part of the covenant community. Very few Christians uh, will deny that. I I haven't met too many who will say, no, 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 no. Even if a Jewish person has rejected Christ, by nature of the fact that they are biologically related to Abraham, they're part of the... No, no, no. Because if you've read, you know, Galatians... Um, or Romans, you you know that can't be the answer. The answer has got to be no one is no one is in the covenant community today apart from faith in Jesus Christ. Like he's the door. I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So most Christians will get that, but they have not thought that through. And so they will still be saying things like, Yeah, but unless you bless Israel, God will not bless you. And you just say, Well, mm. oh, pause now. But who is Israel? Is all those promises that were made to Abraham, where do they land? Because Romans 9 says they've never landed on every person who's biologically related to Abraham. That's never been it. Not even in the Old Testament, that wasn't it. And and then Paul very clearly in Galatians 3.16 says, these promises land not on offspring as in all Jews. They land on offspring as in Jesus. And and Paul, just a few few verses later, he says the promised blessing is the Holy Spirit. Right. So, but, but so there's so many category errors here, but, but I find if you just slow down and, and walk with people and say, now, wait a second, you're, are you saying that unless I'm in favor of everything the state of Israel today does, I can't be blessed by God. Even hearing that said back to them, most people will say, well, no, I'm not saying that. Say, okay. So, so what are you saying? And, and, and so I think this is what this does is it just reveals a whole, this pressure, the pressure of this political moment reveals a whole bunch of unexamined theological jargon that just p- comes oozing out of evangelicals under pressure. And then you, you just, you just slow down and help them process all this. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I've always said to people, if the thing you're most excited about after reading the Bible is not the person and work of Jesus, you've read it wrong. And so if you're most excited about the political future of Israel, you, you have read it wrong. So let's go back and, and where yeah. did we get off track? So, so let me agree with you. Ever, I, I mean, I, I, I think God has a plan for future Israel. Yeah, me too. Oh, me totally. Okay, good. So, I, I was going to say, yeah, Romans eleven right? on this, but, but, uh, I, I think so often we lose sight of what the Bible actually teaches, and we get caught up in these other. I, what I have tried to do, so I haven't addressed it Sunday morning. We did pray. I, I watched the news a little bit Sunday mornings. So we did pray for Israel. My The guy that did the pastoral prayer the next week forgot. And boy, did I get flack for that. Why aren't we praying for Israel? I made sure we didn't forget the next week. I'll tell you. <laughs> so, you know, poor guy. I mean, he does, he's, yeah. you know, he's our, our children's pastor, does a great job. And the prayer was fine. Uh, so I just try to remind people we didn't pray about a thousand other things that matter to God as well. And just because we didn't pray for it on our pastoral prayer doesn't mean it's right. irrelevant to us. We've tried to take a bigger picture. So in this world, we will have trouble. We shouldn't be surprised. We're aliens and strangers. Like there's a worldview, I think, in Canada and maybe the U.S. that that everything's going to be OK. We, we follow Jesus. Therefore, he's going to fix everything. Kind of the the Pentecostal on steroids view. And yeah. And I think we need to remind people that this world is not our home. And 
there's going to be chaos. There's going to be terrorism. And when there is, how do we as Christians respond? And, and I, I think we respond like we should be responding every day. We serve in the local church. We share the gospel with our neighbors. We're ready for Jesus. We're, we're passionately living in that relationship. We're holy. We're loving. We're gentle. We, we live our lives for Jesus. And, and this crisis, and there will be another one, and there will be another one, are opportunities, I think, for us to reiterate the importance of a biblical worldview that overflows into a biblical life, and we become those who are imitators of God as dearly loved children, and that's more important than everything else. And then the overflow of that, certainly you can get involved in political and have opinions on other things, but what I have found is if you're truly passionate, let's just use one of the things about your own holiness, that everything is an overflow of that will be in humility because you're comparing yourself to Jesus, not the person next to you that's worse. And so all of a sudden you're approaching life from a much more humble manner. Or if you're saying, I want to be known for my love, I want to be an imitator of God, Ephesians 5, 1 to 2, as a dearly loved child, live a life of love. Well, man, I am so far from that, that, that now the engagement with cultural issues becomes a much different conversation than yeah. the one that's trying to avoid holiness or avoid love or distract from the things that the Bible really talks about. And I, and I really think when you look at the, the New Testament, you guys can correct me on this, but God cares a lot more about our unity and serving in the local church than he does on our position on a lot of the cultural issues we're battling. And so I think if people could say, okay, I want, I want to build unity. I want to build love. I want to serve. I want to use my spiritual gifts in the local church. I, these are things that we're not doing well as a Canadian church. And, and I think biblical obedience would focus more on those things than terrorism, even though terrorism in Israel is a horrific thing and we should have an opinion on it. There's a lot of other things that would shape how we respond if we truly responded to the word of God correctly. Rob, well, that's incredibly helpful. And I think it helps us to get to the kind of the last topic that we should talk through before we end this short, shorter episode of uh, of this podcast. You talk about oneness and unity. And I'm reminded that there's one Lord, one spirit, one baptism, one God and father of all that those the sevenfold unity of Ephesians four. I'm also reminded that Jesus says that the whole of scripture is predicated upon two things, the love of God and neighbor as ourselves. Earlier, R.D. made the comparison between those who are using a secular category of oppressed and oppressor to side with one side or a theological category that maybe is misunderstood about Israel. One, Two other errors I've seen that are a bit shocking to me is one, and even people that, that I've known or know of, is anti-Semitism is real today. Yeah. Also, the language if you defend Israel, the language that you use to speak of Palestinians, many of whom, by the way, are Canadian now, is almost shocking to me and dehumanizing. So how do we... <laughs> It's so sensitive. There's real war and there's real death and it is brutal and gruesome. And we can't just cheese it up by saying a Ned Flanders answer. And yet we're called to love both groups. Like, how do you, how do you advise us practically? Like what, I know we pray, but like there's I, things I we the probably shouldn't say, things we should say, Rob. No, I think the public prayer. So I got yeah. flack for this, but when we prayed on that first morning, I prayed for Christians in, in the Palestinian Christians. I, I prayed for Christians in Israel. So so I made sure that the priority of the prayer included, I, and I don't think there's very many people, even in the extremes that are angry with the Palestinians right now. I think Israel's being very careful of their language. I think America, I, I think Hamas, well, that's easy, right? They're They're evil. So they, they need Jesus to repent or they, I, I do think that we just, that's easier to align with. We are praying for people in, in Gaza Strip. We're praying for people in Jordan. Mm -hmm. We're, we're praying for peace. And I think we need to do that as much as we pray for Israel or perhaps as we pray for Israel, because I, I, I think they're aligned. So yeah, we, we pray for Christians in the countries that are, if Israel goes in, there are going to be, which it looks like they are, while the bombing now, there are people who are not a part of Hamas that are being killed. And that is horrific. I, I'm, again, I'm not taking a position politically, probably in my position politically, I would say Israel needs to do it to survive. But, but as a Christian, and as a pastor, that should be heartbreaking. We should weep when we see babies being held by their parents that that should cause us to grieve and to seek to love those people. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that you, you can't afford to be all in. Like I, I don't want to give Facebook advice, but 
I didn't put up the, you know, Ukraine filter um, when the Ukraine Russia war started, because I, I can't identify with either side as a pastor and be like, this is the side of righteousness. Yeah. And I'm not doing it now either. Like I'm, I'm not putting Israel filter on my Facebook page and I see lots of my friends doing it. And like, I don't think you can do that because are you, are you prepared to say that one side is righteous? I, I think before this is over, nobody's going to be righteous. I will say this. Israel as a state has the right to defend herself. And, uh, and you know Israel's got to do what, she, what Israel's got to do uh, to protect its citizens, and and that's going to be ugly. But uh, they didn't start the ugliness, so it's it's. But there's no real, you know, when this. But before this is over, I don't think I want to I want to be associated with one side as as saying this is the side of righteousness. And I think we have to be careful too, because we can be so you know Team Israel that we forget. We, we've got Palestinian Christians in my B2 group, my leadership group. I've got a, a, um, a Christian from Jordan, a Jordanian Christian. He's struggling right now because all his Christian friends on Facebook are so gung-ho Israel that he he feels like, am I still welcome here? Like, is this still a thing for me? And so we just got to be careful. We, we got to say, listen, at, any state has the right to defend their borders and their citizens. Done. Terrorist attacks are evil and wicked. What was what happened with, that Hamas did is evil and wicked. We don't have to pull any punches there. But when innocent civilians start dying, uh, when you know babies are are hit by bombs, um, I, I I don't think I don't think there's anything to do other than lament and, and pray. RD, did you? Yeah, I would I would agree with both of you guys. And I, the way that I think about it, why and the way I try to present it to our people is um, as Christians, we bring eternity to bear on all of these issues right and um you know acts 14 it's through many tribulations that we enter into the kingdom of god um the the centrality of the person and the work of jesus if we give people that framework where there's a real heaven to gain and a real hell to shun then it filters through to the person of jesus and then you have a completely different lens through which you see both sides or all sides of an issue like this. Mm -hmm. We pray that, that people would repent, bow their knee to Jesus and be reconciled to God. Hmm. Yeah. We're citizens I... of heaven ultimately, right? We're aliens and strangers here on earth. I love Canada. If, if I could choose to be a citizen of any nation, I'd probably choose Israel, but I am way far superseded by my love for God and my desire to see the gospel go forth. So already I just hundred percent with you. I think if I'm just summarizing the conversation really simply as we end here, we need the moral integrity to call evil, evil. And yet, as yes. Paul says in Romans 15, we should welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us, despite your origin, despite your ethnicity, despite your prior national commitments. We live in the country, we're, we're the church, but also as Canadians, we have Palestinian, Israeli connected people in our congregations. And therefore, we need to be able to be as welcoming to them in Canada as yes. Christ is to us. Yes, which is massively important, and uh, despite maybe our personal or political beliefs that we and have, we want them to be in heaven with us. Well, the gospel at the end of the day, we preach Christ and Him crucified. Thank you, RD. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Paul, for participating in this. And we'll, I guess, see you next time in December for our next episode of this uh, pastoral forum. Thanks, guys. Right, thanks.